Hi, I'm John Persinos, Editorial Director of Investing Daily. Welcome to my video presentation for Monday, August 22nd. To view our full range of publications and trading services, visit our website at investingdaily.com. Also, visit the website of our subsidiary, streetauthority.com. The dog days of August are upon us. Summer is starting to fade. As a New Englander, I consider the fall, with its turning of the leaves, to be the most beautiful season. But autumn usually isn't kind to the stock market. September through October is historically the worst performing period of the year for the stock market. September is the only month that shows a decline on average over the past 100 years. Indeed, September 2021 was the S&P 500's worst month since the nadir of the pandemic-induced market crash in March 2020. Will history repeat itself this September? Let's look at the investment backdrop for the final days of summer. The theories for the so-called September effect, they're all over the map. The most plausible, but still tenuous, explanation is that traders return from their summer holidays to see that the problems they thought had been only small clouds on the horizon are now serious and will dominate the remainder of the year. There's also the October effect, but that's more psychological than statistical. Wall Street harbors the perception that stock markets decline during the month of October because... Well, that's been the month of notable crashes, e.g. in 1929, 1987, and 2008. But the empirical data go against the theory. Last week, U.S. and international stocks closed lower as recurring worries took center stage again. Take a look at the following table. The major indices declined last week as follows. The Dow Jones Industrial Average minus 0.2%, the S&P 500 minus 1.2%, the NASDAQ minus 2.6%, in the EAFE minus 0.9%. Crude oil prices fell 2.6% and currently hover below $90 per barrel. The benchmark 10-year Treasury yield has fallen below the 3.0% threshold. Markets are attempting to gauge whether the Federal Reserve will boost interest rates by 50, 75, or 100 basis points at its next policy meeting in September as it seeks to combat elevated inflation. The mood on Wall Street has been volatile, but at least consumers seem to be getting more confident, and that's a good sign for equity markets. The University of Michigan's Consumer Confidence Index fell to a record low of 50.0 in June, but the index seems to have bottomed. The index in early August rose to 55.1, up from 51.5 in July. This reading beat the market expectation of 52.5. A bottoming out and then rebound in consumer sentiment typically paves the way for positive stock market performance, as you can see from this chart. In the three prior occurrences, when the sentiment index dipped below 60, 1980, 2008, and 2011, and then started to recover, the stock market was higher in each of the following 6- and 12-month periods, with the S&P 500 averaging an increase of 16% over the next 6 months and 20.9% over the following 12 months. New data published last week by China's National Bureau of Statistics showed that China's economic slump accelerated in July, mostly due to a real estate crisis and strict covert lockdowns. And that's been weighing on Chinese equities. The real estate picture in the world's second largest economy is particularly grim. Take a look. From January to July, national real estate development investment in China was 7.9 billion won, a year-over-year -year decrease of 6.4%. The sub-index of residential investment was 6 billion won, a decline of 5.8%. China's status as the world's manufacturing hub is why the economic consequences of the resurgent pandemic in that country continues to exert ripple effects around the world. Many of the world's largest consumer brands are heavily reliant on Chinese manufacturing and are still trying to cope with supply constraints. This dynamic appears likely to persist into the autumn. In the coming days, the economic docket is chock full of data that has the potential to move markets. I'll pinpoint for you the coming highlights. Manufacturing and Services PMI and New Home Sales, Tuesday. The PMI numbers for those sectors have been encouraging lately. Durable goods, orders, and pending home sales, Wednesday. The latest data from the housing sector has been weak. Initial jobless claims and gross domestic product Thursday. We've been getting consistently good news about the employment situation. Personal consumption expenditures, PCE, and 
Consumer Spending Sentiment Friday. PCE bears close scrutiny. The PCE contains broader data than the more popularly known Consumer Price Index and serves as the central bank's favorite inflation measure. The PCE is the North Star by which the Fed gauges inflation. The next PCE for July is expected to offer signs that inflation has peaked. Cooling inflation gives the Fed more wiggle room to turn dovish, but don't expect the central bank to abandon tightening altogether. And if the PCE this week comes in harder than expected, well, all bets are off. Are you spooked by the market uncertainty I've just described? If you're looking for a way to generate steady income with reduced risk, consider our premium trading service, Rapier's Income Accelerator, helmed by our income expert and my colleague, Robert Rapier. Robert Rapier can show you how to squeeze up to 18 times more income out of dividend stocks with just a few minutes of work each week. For details, click the URL at the bottom of the article that accompanies this video on the Investing Daily website. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. Stay invested and stay safe.